So I'm uh, Kim Chavez. I'm one of the um, Cooper Emergency Medicine and Critical Care uh, doctors. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about the approach and management of unstable uh, bradycardia. Um, and so we've all been there, right? You know, patient comes in and the nurse comes running to you and says the patient's bradying down. Um, and this terrifies all of us. You know, your heart rate's skyrocketing, theirs is plummeting. And today we're going to go over, you know, what what to do um, so you can feel at ease taking care of these patients and have an algorithm or approach to them. So this is how I approach pretty much all my sick patients, but we'll really focus on some key history elements, you know, the EKG and how you're going to curate your differential and ultimately come up with your treatment. So um, we'll talk about these in a, in a second, but, you know, to define symptomatic bradycardia, um, first got to have bradycardia to begin with. So have a heart rate below 60 and then have symptoms that are relate that are actually being caused by the bradycardia itself and not something else going on. Um, so whenever I walk into the room, I'm always looking at the monitor, you know, whether it's the EKG monitor or the vent monitor, you know, you want to be able to see, um, you know, what's going on. And so the big things I look for are, you know, I look at the blood pressure. I probably look at that first, you know, as it's cycling, you know, I want to know, are they normal tensive? Are they hypotensive or hypertensive? You know, cause it's going to give me some clues of maybe what's going on. Um, I ideally want a temperature, although we know that's sometimes impossible to get <laughs> on, on the initial uh, critically ill patients, but you want to know if the patient's maybe hypothermic and could explain what's going on with their uh, slow heart rate. You know, I want to see if the patient's tachypnic. I want to know if they're hypoxic. Are they on a non-rebreather, um, struggling, you know, struggling to breathe a bit? Um, and then you kind of move on, you know, if you're able to, you know, if you have, a, you know, a couple minutes, the patient's maybe quasi-stable, you know, see if the patient's having any symptoms related to the bradycardia. So some key features you want to know, did they have a syncopal episode before coming in? You know, has this happened before? Um, are they complaining of crushing chest pain or struggling or struggling to breathe? Um, you know, you want to see if, you know, maybe a family member reports they're acting more confused lately. They're more, they're having more malaise. Um, they're not acting right. Um, and then that leads you to target your physical, um, physical exam. So you want to look like things, you know, from head down to toe, you know, you want to see is the patient confused? Are they becoming progressively encephalopathic while they're sitting there in your emergency department? Um, you want to look at, listen to their heart, listen to their lungs, trying to see for things like rails or a new murmur. Um, you know, you want to check their extremities for perfusion. Um, are they cold? Are they mottled? Um, I believe it was Dr. Greenwood who spoke about looking for cap refill. You know, is it delayed and you're not able to, and you're not, um, your patient's not well perfusing because these can all indicate that something real serious is going on. Um, and to kind of take a step back, you know, you want to think about this equation that we all learned in med school, but it applies day to day, you know, when you're taking care of these patients. So you got to think of your cardiac output and how it equals to your heart rate and then multiplied by your stroke volume and how that's affected. So as your heart rate drops, your cardiac output's naturally going to drop, you know, and it's a little more complex than this, but your afterload will increase to some extent maybe giving you maybe a normal blood pressure in some of these scenarios um, that might give you some false reassurance. Um, but ultimately, you might not be able to keep your, your body might not be able to keep up with the metabolic um, demands. And then you have a decreased perfusion relative, you know, to your to the demands of the of your of your body and what's causing this um, bradycardia. So you really got to, you know, be mindful of this, you know, as you're starting to implement some of your therapies. So the next part is really important, you know, looking at your EKG. And Dr. Philippone, you know, um, who talked earlier was one of my mentors, um, like Dr. Damoth. And, you know, she really drilled looking at the EKG and kind of looking to see how that will guide your management. So real quick, and I know this kind of kind of a basic design, but, you know, looking at your sinus node, your his, your down your AV node and your Hisperkinji system and knowing how your cardiac conduction system works, right? Because if you think about it, you really want to look at your QRS. Um, just to kind of simplify it for everyone, things at or above your AV node will probably have a more narrow QRS in most cases. And that might mean more, some more benign processes that are going on versus if, you're, if your block or something is more distal um, in down lower past the AV node into your his, the bundle of his or your Purkinje system, you might need to worry about you know, things like a third degree heart block that might not respond to certain medications that we'll talk about later. Um, and these are just some examples, you know, this is, um, a case of severe sinus, um, you know, a bradycardia, um, and then it's complicated by, as you can see here, a pretty long, um, a pretty long, uh, sinus arrest essentially until we get another beat here You can see the normal PR interval there. You can see your narrow QRS 
Um, and then, and then you can kind of tell this might be something more, more proximal, serious, but definitely, you know, something you need to, you need to think about. And this is the one we always see, the one we dread, because, you know, it's the one that we're kind of, we're kind of heading down the, the path of pacing. And so now we look here, and this is um, what we would define as a uh, third degree heart block. As you can see, your P waves um, are marching out here, but there's not a QRS that's following it. Um, and, the, and this QRS here, you see how it looks wide? So you're definitely looking at more of ventricular, maybe um, ventricular escape rhythm, maybe junctional, um, that's, causing, that's causing this issue. It might lead you to lead down towards different treatments. So now I want you to run through the possible causes, all right? So this is a mnemonic. I don't always love mnemonics, but this one's actually pretty easy. Um, so D-I-E, don't let your patient die, right? <laughs> so you want to think of, when you walk into the room, you want to think about what drugs are people on, okay? So things like your beta blockers, your calcium channel blockers. You know, did grandma take a couple extra today because she was confused? You know, or, you know, are they, are they on digoxin? They've been having nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea the last couple of times, uh, the last couple of days. Um, so this is really important to look at their med list um, and kind of get that history from your from your your collateral collateral people, either from EMS or your family members. Um, and the next big one we'll talk about in a, a couple slides is ischemia. So looking at acute coronary syndrome and seeing how these can progress to different certain types of blocks. And then the big one, you know, the one we're always thinking about is hyperkalemia, right? Can cause a lot of crazy things. Um, but in this context, we'll talk about it, you know, particularly in the slow, uh, patients come in with slow heart rate. Um, so this is just a, a quick example, just a, I think it was a total overdose um, from Life in the Fast Lane, which is a great resource, um, showing, you know, sinus bradycardia, but a pretty prolonged uh, QTC interval. Um, and so you got to worry in some of these patients, you know, will they get bradycardia induced, you know, and, get, and kind of go into torsades. So it's important to kind of keep a close eye on other things that can be caused by certain overdoses or certain toxicities. Um, the big one here, you know, we can all clearly recognize is an inferior STEMI. Um, you know, and the big part that you want to think about, particularly in your inferior STEMI, is, is that it's most usually supplied by your RCA and your AV node in particular, um, if you think back to our diagram, is, uh, is uh, supplied by a branch of the, um, of the RCA, um, it gives it the blood supply for your AV node. And so then you can typically see a wide range of blocks, something, you know, very simple, maybe some sinus bradycardia. Or you can progress a little further and get like a first degree block, second degree block, and then suddenly you're in third degree block. Um, the good news for most of those blocks that do, do kind of stem from inferior, inferior stem is they're usually transient um, and they'll self-resolve. Um, but the other category you need to think about is anterior stemmies. So anterior stemmies your, is affected by your LAD, right? And that supplies a larger part of your myocardium. And so if you start seeing blocks in an anterior stemmy, you should be a little worried. Um, those tend to have a wider QRS. They tend to arise kind of further down your conduction system, down your Hisperkinji system, and that might require pacing. And these usually portend a uh, worse prognosis. So that's why I'm always, when someone comes in with a STEMI, you got to get the pads on them. You got to be ready kind of for anything to happen. And then, you know, the, then the last part of the dynamonic, the E, the electrolytes, you know, like I said, potassium does a lot of crazy things. If someone's going slow, kind of looks a little wide, um, sort of bizarre looking, you know, think, think hyperkalemia. Um, you know, that's a big, that's a big one that can cause this sort of bizarre looking rhythm and got to have, you know, your calcium, you know, right, you know, ready to go. And this is an EKG, I think someone spoke earlier, the one you get out of your chair for. And this is one I very similar when I was a resident that I got out of my chair and the patient was severely ill and ended up needing dialysis. So I'm not going to go through over, over through all of these because obviously bradycardia in general has a very, very long differential. But in most of these cases, patients are more stable. You know, just a couple to highlight, you know, when you're when you're doing your physical exam, and hopefully it should be evident from your history or your physical, but things like increased ICP, spinal cord injuries, like neurogenic shock. Um, should be more apparent, um, and also things like intra-abdominal hemorrhage that can cause um, kind of paradoxical bradycardia, things to think about, you know, especially in young patients who usually wouldn't see are not usually unstable from bradycardia. You might see a young female writhing around in pain. Think about ectopic, think about intra-abdominal hemorrhage that could be affecting that. And so now we'll go quickly through the treatment. So I don't, you probably can't see this, but it's the AHA um, guidelines um, from 2020 um, that, or 2018 uh, talking about the bradycardia algorithm. And, you know, usually how they, how they started off here, you know, they talk about the same things we talked about, you know, what kind of defines an unstable bradycardia. 
Um, but they also start talking about drugs, which we'll go through. Uh, you know, they kind of go through a stepwise approach, like trying, you know, at, you know, atropine, then going into meds and then pacing, you know, but in a lot of these patients, they're very, very sick. And so you don't always have time to just try one by one. You got to have everything ready um, at once. So atropine, you know, it's the, the med that, you know, as soon as a patient's bored of the nurses, your nurses love to draw up and be like, can I give the atropine? And for the most part, you can say, sure, you know, it usually it's ineffective. It's only effective sometimes in like 28% of actual symptomatic bradycardic patients. Uh, so, you know, you really want to have your red other drugs ready while you're, while you're pushing the atropine. Once you use one dose, you know, and it's not working, uh, you know, you might want to think about moving to other drugs. You know, it blocks the action of acetylcholine at your parasympathetic sites, um, you know, helps block that vagal tone. But, you know, you need to be able to think of other medications if this is not, this doesn't work. Uh, oh, and just a quick point, you know, for atropine, you obviously don't want to use, you know, use it on your cardiac transplant patients. You know, they are usually de um, denervated anyway, so you're not going to get that effect. Uh, and so the next drug we'll talk about very briefly is dopamine. It's still in the algorithm. You know, a lot of this medication com this medication usually comes pre-mixed. So sometimes in certain, you know, institutions you might work in, you know, might be easier for your nurses to grab up front. Uh, although it's pretty easy for them to get epinephrine, which is what we'll talk about next. You know, your uh, the effect that you'll get will vary on your dose. You know, usually it's like uh, between five to twenty mics per kilo per minute, uh, and it has multiple uh, different receptor activity. And so the big one is epinephrine, right? You know, we love epinephrine. We grab it for a lot of things, but you know, it really has that beta, you know, that beta adrenergic um, receptor activity on the heart especially when you want to get your heart rate up. Um, and so as you can start with either two to 10 mics per minute um, or do push dose, you know, 20 to 30, you know, mics, you know, as needed to try to help get the patient stabilized in that acute phase. You got to be real careful though, because it can increase your myocardial demand. Um, so like Dr. Gala and everyone spoke earlier, you know, in cardiogenic shock, you know, you got to be a little careful, you know, you might start this, but you might be quickly moving to the next things that we'll talk about, which are, which will be pacing. Uh, and this is kind of an adjunct. I don't think it was in the guidelines, but I always like to think about having calcium on board, you know, particularly for the kind of peri-arrest patient who you might not know might be hyperkalemic, you know, to consider giving empiric calcium if they you maybe have some hint of a history or they have a dialysis fistula that could indicate that their hyperkalemia is possible is possibly causing their, their uh, symptomatic bradycardia. And then when all else fails, you're going to go for electricity. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about, you know, using transcutaneous pacing, transvenous pacing, you know, we always start with trans, uh, transcutaneous, then go to transvenous, as we've kind of talked about. Um, and I'm not going to go into it, because I know, um, I think Dr. Quasi and um, Dr. Patino, I believe, had both spoken about, or um, one of the other physicians talked about transvenous pacing. Um, but really, transcutaneous is quick and easy to do. You know, you want to think about your, you know, the vectors of where you're placing your pads, you know, APs usually usually best. This one is lateral, but on the picture, but you can move them around if you're not great getting good capture. Always think about starting high and transcutaneous pacing in order to get that capture early on in your sick patient. But you really do need like sedation. You need to, it can be very painful. You might need to intubate these patients, kind of depends. But transvenous, you know, is a little more invasive and there are some complications um, which are detailed up there like tamponade, pneumothorax, just from doing the procedure itself. Um, and so then to quickly summarize, um, you know, cause I think bradycardia overall is pretty straightforward. You know, you got to have an approach when you walk into the room, you know, have all your therapies in the back of your mind as you're walking in, you want to think about your dynamonic, what's going to kill your patient immediately, and then start fit fitting your history and your physical exam into that, into that, um, into that work frame. Um, and then coming up with your differential and then initiating your treatments. And that is all I got. Thank you. <laughs>